Sunday, 19 January 1986. Religion and Practical Life. Yo devo agno yoshu yosh bunam abhivesha Yo hadisu bunash padishu tasmai devayo namo namaha We pay our obedience to that great God who has formed himself into this world of name and form. May we all be able to feel His presence within and without. Topic is religion in everyday life. <coughs> now, what is religion? <coughs> religion <coughs> means a type of discipline which follows a type of discipline which is if. That discipline is followed meticulously, honestly, sincerely, and intelligently. It is bound to transform our life. And that transformed life will help us to enjoy peace and freedom within ourselves. So, religion brings us back to God, back to unity, back to strength and peace. The chaotic life can be turned, transformed into a life of cosmos, life of un unity, provided certain religious principles are followed enthusiastically and intelligently. So Swamiji says, It brings to man eternal life. It has made man what he is and will make of this human animal a god. So religious principles can help us to achieve that divine union. So it is very useful for every one of us at every stage of life. That is what religion can do. Take religion from human society and what will remain? Nothing but a forest of brutes. Sense happiness is not the goal of humanity. Wisdom is the goal of our life. We find that man enjoys his intellect more than an animal enjoys its senses. And we see that man enjoys his spiritual nature even more than his rational nature. So the highest wisdom must be this spiritual knowledge. With this knowledge will come bliss. All these things of this world are but the shadows, the manifestations in the third or fourth degrees of the real knowledge and bliss. So whatever happiness and peace we enjoy in this world are very lowest form of happiness compared to the highest happiness which helps us to come near to God. Or in other words, that excellence of spiritual life will give us maximum happiness. And that maximum happiness is enjoyed 
in a very dim manner in this world. Now, how it comes? Who can be impelled to follow religious instructions for one's development? So he says, the renunciation is the true background of all religious thoughts, wherever it be, and you will always find that as this idea of renunciation lessens, the more will the senses creep into the field of religion and spirituality will decrease in the same ratio. So where you don't find the renunciation, you don't find religion too. Real religion or real spiritual attitude cannot stay side by side with enjoyment, with sense pleasure. So a spiritual seeker, a truth seeker, a holy man in the real sense of the term is to forgo the pleasures of life, is to renounce the ordinary things of life. Without that renunciation, it is never possible for any person to develop that sort of spiritual uh, love. <coughs> so, if we cannot follow to that, at least we can follow this. And uh, let me tell you a fact. In the Del Carnegie's book, which is a very useful book, you can all read. <laughs> One day, he and his wife decided to have a guest for dinner. In that book, it is there. You can read it. So they were taking a good deal of care to make their guest happy in the dinner table. And naturally, you know, they take one week or two weeks preparation, mental and physical. Then, unfortunately, just before the dinner, he talked out to the housewife that napkin is not matching with the tablecloth. So she was very much disturbed, and she was frantically trying to find out something which will help her to make a big show. But she was not able to do anything, shouting, screaming, quarreling, losing tempers. All of a sudden, everything she was, it was study. The husband was telling her, please keep quiet. It is not very important. Nobody is going to notice in that way. And even if they notice, they won't tell. So let us enjoy the dinner. I am not going to spoil the dinner. But a lady, she was so obsessed with that fact that it is a great dereliction of duty on the part of the housewife which is not to maintain the decency and decorum as enjoined upon us by the current society. So dinner was completely lost, at least for the lady, housewife. She could not enjoy, although she prepared for 15 days. So, we have to derive a great lesson that at least religious life helps us to rescue from this pettiness, from the smallness, from the non-essentials of life. Non-essentials of life will definitely swallow up if we have got nothing higher and greater and greater. So spiritual life, a spiritual seeker, a spiritual seeking, this vocation of ritual seeking will definitely help us to enjoy a certain amount of freedom. Otherwise, we will be completely swallowed by the most ordinary things of life. Thank <laughs> you.
Lacan's sense of reverence also is very, very essential. I tell you another real anecdote. Swami Sharadananda, he was in Udbodhan when a young boy came and used to come to him. And whenever he inquired about his mother, he says, my mother is a hopeless person. She doesn't understand anything, this and that. Boy was apparently going to the college or university. So one day, even a man like Sadananto lost, lost his temper. It is written in the book, and he slept. <coughs> the boy at once left, young boy after all, college boy, at once left, and wandered throughout the cities. Unfortunately, he had no money in his pocket. So he could not get any food. No, nobody took any pity upon him. At last, at night, he was passing through a lane where a housewife saw. Then the housewife, seeing the emaciated, languished face of the young boy, told you, well, boy, I believe you have not taken any food. So he read all his stories. He said, no, I have not got any food. Whole day I am roaming. So her food, which she was going to take, was given to him. Then it was also found he has got no shelter. He has got no head to go. Then lady said, I shall go to some friend's house to sleep. You sleep in my room. The next day he came to some Sharananda. And Sharananda told him, well, do you understand that the mother took care of you? Well, yes, Swami. Nobody took care of me. Whole day I was roaming, I was very hungry, I was thirsty, I was dejected and depressed. <coughs> Nobody said one word of pity to me. But that woman, unknown to me, she took care of me and gave me shelter, gave me food. Well, you should not use such dirty language towards your mother. You must have some reverence, some respect for your mother. This respectful, distasteful attitude will never give you any happiness, any peace in your life. So unless we have got some sort of happy, uh, some sort of faith in spiritual life, we cannot lead life. We cannot love that life. We cannot make any progress in that life. So that sort of faith, that sort of uh, sense of sacredness and sanctity has to be cultivated in our mind. A superior man, as opposed to the ordinary man, has nine aims. First, to see things clearly. Even Holy Mother used to say that whenever you go to a particular area, you observe. You need not tell, but you observe. To understand what he hears, to be one in manners, dignified in bearing, faithful in speech, painstaking at work, to ask to when in doubt, in anger to think of difficulties, in sight of gain to remember. These are the cardinal virtues to be practiced by a person who wants to elevate his or her character. <laughs> Otherwise, but for these cardinal virtues, but for these disciplines, but for this vision of life, we are bound to succumb to the lower depths of the existence. All the impulses which will crowd over our life will drag us to the world of Maya. There is one Chinese proverb that when God gives anybody misfortune, first of all God wants to test the how that person accepts misfortune. If he loses faith in God, if he becomes very much disturbed, 
then it shows that he lacks character. He cannot bear that misfortune state of affairs. So he lacked the strength of faith. That sort of man is hopeless. <coughs> Even in prosperity, we must have character. Without character, we will become arrogant, insolent, proud. A character will help us to enjoy even good fortune in a sober way, in a human way, retaining our humble sense of life. So God also tests us by giving good fortune, whether you are related with success, become proud, or we are maintaining our humility, our sober attitude, or normal outlook without becoming arrogant. So if there is righteousness in the heart, or in other words, if we are impelled by the vision of life, if we have got something before our gaze, which is very higher, purer, super mundane, which cannot be rejected by any means, which must be saved, which must be followed, which must be at least honored. If there is righteousness in the heart, there will be beauty in the character. Character can never be developed unless one has got some holiness of purity within oneself. If there is beauty in the character, there will be harmony in the home. So harmony of the home which is lost today, we are very unhappy to see that chaotic situation is prevailing in the home home was not really happy about to look for. If there is harmony in the home, there will be order in the nation. If there be order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. So peace in the world <coughs> depends upon the evolution of human character. Because human character, when properly evolved, will radiate spiritual culture into the family, into the society, into the nation, and in that way, whole humanity will be beneficiary of that great life. So those who understand business in this way, they will try to develop he, their spiritual life knowing full well that their spiritual aspiration, their spiritual attitude of life, spiritual vision of life, the spiritual discipline is very much helpful to the entire humanity. He or she is possibly contributing something for the greater good of humanity. So, these people are able to maintain that sort of attitude or cultivate that sort of spiritual awareness because they are fully convinced of the logos in nature. There is some law, law within and without. To have some respect for that law <coughs> will enable us to live that life. Then, respect for dead men, or saints and sages, or illumined souls. Because if we do not live that life which is enjoined upon us by these great ones, then we are showing positive disrespect to their personalities. So we cannot feel happy by bypassing the rules and regulations 
given to us for our edification and embellishment. Schopenhauer used to say, very off-quoted quotation, that starry heaven helps me to think of God. The work, nature is the handiwork of God. God has created this nature. How thoughtful he is, how meticulous he is, how scientific he is, how regular he is, how beautiful he is. And also, my conscience tells me that there is something hidden within me which prompts me always to do something good and to reject the bad. So the promptings of inner conscience and the story heaven helps me to understand the existence of supermanian principle popularly addressed as God within and without, and that helps us to lead holy life. Those who are not impelled by this vision, those who are not well matured in spiritual life, those who are drifting by following certain social conventions and taboos, naturally they cannot develop spiritual life in the real sense of the term. They are always fearful. There is a story, a greedy beast was called by a dying man, almost dying man. The dying man was very calculating, very miserly, but still for the sake of his life, in order to avoid hell, he had to summon the priest, and priests also equally greedy, to be extort as much as he can from the dying man. So he was saving him limb by limb, past the chip, one leg, one hand, one back, one head, like that. Then he thought, well, on the right, right leg is there. So he said, I shall charge you little more money for this. Sir, this is made of wood. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a real leg. I have lost my leg many years before. These people, those who do not understand the principles of holiness, those who are not well grounded, those who are not well matured, those who are not having that conviction within himself or herself, they have to follow the social conventions. That has got some meaning definitely. It will help them in gradually. But those who are able to understand for themselves why all these things, what is the meaning of all these things, what is the usefulness and utility of all these things, then they will be able to appreciate better the things of spiritual life. So virtue is the backbone of life, as love is the blood of life. So development of life depends upon the development of virtue. So we must have lots of patience for that. Without patience, one can never lead her life of rectitude. Because you are expecting something which will come in due course, very slowly. It, it will never come by leaps and bounds or instant success, what we know. So you have to be very patient, very careful and very uh, faithful. There is a story that which highlights this patience of a seeker of truth. A particular recluse was practicing meditation in a particular lonely place. And there was a young girl in the neighborhood. She led partnership life as a result of which she was carried. So when she was in that state, she was abused by the people, localities, and she invariably pointed out to that recluse who is a real mischief monger, responsible for all these things. So naturally, his parents and other people of the locality, they accused him, they reprimanded him, 
they insulted him and he never retaliated any single word. He kept quiet. He said, is that so? He never uttered any other word. Is that so? So he was accused. He remained okay. calm and quiet. Then when child was born, they brought the child to that recluse and pressed under his care. So the, he managed to take care of the child. He said, is that so? He was never divulging any secrets. He was not protesting. He was only said, is that so? That girl after some time, she was very ashamed of her conduct because she knew very well he was an innocent person. So she could not bear the pangs of remorse and anguish. So she went to him and apologized for her misconduct and told everybody <coughs> that he is innocent. His innocence was proved ultimately because he was able to maintain that fortitude, that faith in God, that patience and forbearance. Cultivation of virtue will definitely lead <coughs> to humanness, righteousness, propriety, wisdom, and trustworthiness. Most of all, trustworthiness, if we forget any other thing. We cannot trust each, each other because they lack the character. And character has to be proved by becoming a trustworthy, by becoming faithful by leading that life of rectitude. Without that, nobody will trust. And this, this plagues us that I am not trustworthy. I am not proving myself as a responsible person. I am irresponsible. The irresponsibility bothers us. So everywhere we find that we say, well, selfishness, as Swami so selfishness is a cheap sin, thinking of ourselves first. We all teach these ch children, don't be selfish. The Buddha T. Washington, that famous Negro preacher, he learned his most important lessons in life in Agricultural Institute in Virginia. And what was the lesson he learned? And which he remembered in the old age? Those who are happiest are those who do the most for others. So those who are sacrificing their interest for the happiness of the others, they are really happy person, contented and fulfilled person. They have at least eschewed their pettiness, their parochial demands of industry life. The modern trend is enjoy yourself which is unspiritual motivation. Self-importance is being developed gradually by following this lifestyle. So we are binding ourselves daily by inflating our ego and seeking self-pleasure as the goal of our life. Now there are some severe complex. They think that they are the only people who can save the society or the family or the neighborhood. So this severe complex is very much with, within them. So they also practice unselfishness with that end in view, but for them, or but for him, or for her, so he will suffer. So they are also indirectly cultivating self-importance. Although they, we are the mask of holiness, catering the needs of the people, it is not very genuine within their heart. They are not becoming humble, they are not becoming free, they are not becoming calm, they are not becoming spiritual, they are becoming egoistic. Although they are draining their energy in serving people by becoming philanthropists or good doers. If you read the Eric Fromm's book, that, then you'll find that how Eric Fromm 
has unmasked these people that behind their self-sacrifice, behind their philanthropic activity, behind their social work, there is self-centeredness. They are inflating their egos. They do not want to break their egos. They do not want to deflate their egos. They want to harden their egocentric attitude of life. You have read in the famous book, Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. We live in a success-oriented society. We have to have some success at any cost. Without success, life loses its meaning. So being nurtured in this society, we are all trying to seek success in this sphere of life by hook or crook, because that is a passport to get the happiness of some recognition in society. So he writes the book, Arthur Miller, in that book, Death of a Salesman. He says that incredible feats of activity are undertaken by those people who are intoxicated by that madness to have success at any cost. And this gentleman, Willie Loman, that character, he oriented himself with that philosophy of life and he taught that philosophy to his children. So every one of them was trying best to achieve success by giving their best. In that way, they drained themselves, exhausted themselves, killed themselves, and ultimately he writes that one dies for one ego ideal rather than let it go. It is satisfaction of the ego ideal. I must have some success by hook or crook. And for that reason I am ready to die. I don't want sanity, I don't want peace, I don't want freedom, I don't want enlightenment. I want success. So he painted right that he never knew who he was. The biggest question of human life, to decipher the meaning of human life, what I am, where I am proceeding, what is my business, these supreme questions do not bother us. We are continuously avoiding that great vocation of life. We don't want to know in depth the meaning of life, the mystery of life don't want to follow that vocation which will help us to understand the meaning of our life. There is fact, there is an, an article I read that nameplate is turned towards the man, say engineer this and that, whatever it is. So why so? The visitor asked, why the nameplate is to, towards you, not towards us. Well, I like to be reminded what I am. It's a big business. Because we are forgetting ourselves. I must know who I am for that nameplate that will help me. We are forgetting ourselves. We are so involved in the work. So exhausted that we cannot, we don't remember us. What is our goal of life? What is our name? What is our profession? What I am actually. Now, there is a story that one gentleman had some accident. So he went to the doctor and doctor operated upon. He was given crutch to walk and he was walking in the street. He filed a suit. All lawyer came to file a suit against the 
complete <coughs> and told him that a, <coughs> no matter what doctor says, you should use this crash for six months. Then you'll get good, good deal of money. <laughs> After two, three months, he was tired. He said, my limbs are all right. I can walk. Doctor says, you can easily walk. You are all right. And he told the doctor, my lawyer says you used to for six months. How can I give it up? If you want to get money, you have to have an artificial means of walking in order to prove that you are still incapacitated. So, of course, there are some doctors you all know. They want to keep their patients. They do not allow freedom to their patient. They don't say, no, you have to come. If you do not come, then you will suffer. So they create an impact in the mind of the patient by making him or her very weak, very vulnerable, without giving strength, without giving support, without giving real help. Most of them, or some of them at least, they try to extort money by keeping the patient entirely dependent on them. Now a big question comes. We have to have some faith in transcendental reality or in holiness or purity or in God. If that faith is lacking, then we cannot live our life. And if we want to lead our life, we are bound to be swallowed by the nonsense of the life. We will not be able to maintain our sanity, our idealism, or our inspired attitude of living. To have that, we have to continuously keep ourselves exposed to that thought, to that area, to that goal, or to that vision of life. Even in concentration camp, it is written by a Viennese doctor, Viktor Frankl. He was also a prisoner. He said, in that awkward situation, some people save themselves by developing their faith in God. That was a very painful situation, you all know. But in the midst of painful situation, some weak partner, apparently they are ordinary partner, not having a robust health, but they had faith in God. By cultivating that faith, or by deepening that faith, by maintaining that faith, or increasing that faith, or intensifying that faith, they were able to withstand the shocks of that concentrated life. Of course, it's again. And by hugging that truth, by hugging that Believe that faith that God will rescue them or they will be rescued somehow or other. They were able to generate indomitable courage within themselves to escape the degradation of their concentration camp. Ultimately, they were released. They were able to lead good life. Victor Frankl himself, a Viennese psychiat psychiatrist, is a witness, and he has written a book, Will to Live. If we have got tremendous will to live, live not ordinary life, higher life, greater life, spiritual life, then that intense willingness, indomitable courage, or that faith in transcendental reality, or in holiness and purity, will help us to maintain a sanity of life, sinner views of life. To use the word of Rudy or Kipling, we can say, although we see many people are losing their heads, still we'll be able to save our heads, provided we are insulated, insulated by that idealism. So we find that the great person even like Tolstoy, Mahatma Gandhi, they also 
had to take shelter under truth, under God. And by having faith in God, in spite of bad situation, bad environment, or depression, they were able to maintain their soul forces, soul awareness, their faith in God, faith in truth-seeking life. Not that these people are saved from the calamities of life. Everybody is confronted. How to save ourselves? How to keep that view of life? How to have faith in God? So these people are able to save themselves because they have developed that sort of faith. And by developing that faith, by intensifying that faith, by increasing that faith, they are able to withstand the trace and strain of confrontation, of misfortune. So very plainly speaking, religious life, not the religious life, the spiritual life, holy life, is a must for everybody at any stage of life. Because without that, nobody is expected to get any peace or any happiness or any harmony within oneself. And these are also very indispensable factors for anyone's life. We are not able to live life being deprived of these cardinal principles of life. So these principles of life can be enjoyed by those who are trying hard to save themselves from the inroads of impulses. Impulsive life can be curbed, can be controlled, can be attenuated, can be kept at a distance, <coughs> provided the truth-seeking life takes root. So when a truth-seeker is trying hard to save himself or herself from the excruciating pain of ordinary life, he or she makes certain progress by developing tremendous faith in that life, by developing that soul force within oneself, and by holiness and purity, by the environmental guidance, one is able to uphold oneself. So these are the very great questions today. We are facing very positively this great question, whether to be or not to be, whether this search for holiness and purity or for super mundane enlightenment is to be abandoned for the sake of ordinary life or the aspirations of ordinary life can be controlled to a certain extent so that mind can be made little free to pursue those vocations of life. So we have ransacked the entire globe to find peace. We have achieved phenomenal success. The truth of all these researches points out to us we cannot live without that higher vision of life. We cannot enjoy our life. So that is the greatest research, that, that is the greatest discovery in 20th century that man cannot live by bread alone. Enormous quantities of bread are being manufactured daily and being available at our disposal. But we are still very, very unhappy, restless and depressed. If we want to maintain the human form or human dignity, we have to have some faith in super idealism, 
which alone can save us from this degradation. So this vocation, which promises us to lead to that realm of beatitude, is to be pursued by us with intelligence and with love for that vocation. Let us pray. Om Pashato Shakgamaya Tamosho Ma Jyotir Gamaya Amitam Ma Bhittur Ma Amitam Gamaya Avir Avir Moedi Rudra Jati Jashnang Mukham Om Shanti 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 Hori Om Tassat May He who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jews, Allah of the Mahavadans and Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Chinese, Auramas of the Rastrians and Brahma of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from disease and death to mortality. May the all-loving being manifest himself unto us. May the all-loving being manifest himself unto us. May the all-loving being manifest himself unto us and grant us avoiding understanding and all-consuming divine love. Oh, peace, peace, peace unto us all.